We were just watching attorneys questioning the father of Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis at her misconduct hearing. Willis is leading the Georgia election interference case against former President Trump and a number of co-defendants. Now Trump and some of those co-defendants are trying to have Willis removed from the case, alleging she had an improper relationship with Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade and financially benefited from hiring Wade to work on the case. Willis's father, John Floyd, testified that he didn't formally meet Nathan Wade until 2023, after Wade was appointed a special prosecutor. Floyd also confirmed Willis's testimony that she learned from her father to keep a lot of cash on hand at home, explaining in his words, it's a black thing, and that due to personal experience, he had told his daughter to always have six months' worth of cash at home at all times. Let's bring in investigative reporter Olivia Rubin outside the court, ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, ABC News contributor, former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons, for more on this. Brian, I want to go straight to that question of keeping cash in the house, because you had said that was an issue that could raise cred credibility with Fonnie Willis. The fact that she and Nathan Wade said that she often uh, would, would compensate Wade for paying for dates or trips, she would pay him back in cash. And now we have her father now explaining why she had so much cash on hand at home and why she always had cash on her with him saying, I always told her since she was a little girl to do that. What did you make of that response? Yeah, so I think the defense is going to try to make some hay out of the fact that he was prepped. I don't think the preparation went past, hey, they're going to ask you this question. But the one thing that I will disagree with him, because even during this break, I asked my wife about it, and she said, no, even my um, father, and my wife is not black, tells me this. Little fun fact, in the United States of America, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which allowed women to open banks in their own name, happened in 1974. Fonnie Willis was born at a time where she wouldn't be allowed to open a bank in her own name. You don't have to add race to that context. So the concept of a woman not having the opportunity to always go to bank with credit card, even using that story, and keeping cash on hand is historically accurate as to what a person would be taught in that day and age. So it's foolish to argue otherwise. Uh, Chris, I, I want to go to that, that one of those last questions that we just heard. Uh, attorneys asked Willis's father how he knew the question of cash would come up. And he said, because he was prepared for that line of questioning, why was that moment so significant? And then hearing him say that, you know, he did see some of what happened yesterday in the testimony yesterday, because it's all over radio, it's all of TV, and he was not instructed that he's under sequester. So, Diane, yeah, you're getting exactly to what the point is, and that's the rule of sequestration. The rule of sequestration is that witnesses can't get together and discuss their testimony either before or after they testify. However, witness prep is part of what we do as trial attorneys. As a matter of fact, if you don't prep your witnesses prior to going to trial or prior to a hearing, it's almost malpractice. So it's not at all surprising that uh, that, that he was prepped coming in and some of the questions that they were going to ask. It's no secret that this case is all about cash. I think it was even in the state's response that she carries cash and paid him back in that way. So, I mean, that he they knew they were going to call him. They asked him that question. He answered it correctly to them, and presumably he testified truthfully under oath today. So, Chris, the, the issue of being prepped, not a big deal. What about the issue of him saying, yeah, I heard about it on TV and I heard about it on the radio, the testimony that happened yesterday? So I think if that was going to be a bigger deal, I think we would have heard some sort of motion to strike his testimony based on a violation of the rule of against sequestration. Um, but that's not the remedy for a violation of the rule. A violation of the rule is typically contempt, and it's usually contempt against one of the lawyers. And, uh, you know, what a bad look to move for contempt against this man who's done a, uh, had a tremendous legal career and has done a lot. So I, I don't think that that would have been a wise move on their part. I think they're trying to stir up some, you know, controversy about his credibility, maybe suggesting that he was coached in some way. That might work with a jury, but, you know, Judge McAfee himself was a trial lawyer before he takes the bench, and he knows as well as anybody else does that you're going to prep your witness. Prepping doesn't mean telling them what to say. Prepping means asking them questions and finding out what they're going to say, you know, asking them and preparing them in some ways to tell them what questions they might face. And so I didn't say any, hear anything about, you know, John Floyd saying that he was going to testify in a certain way based on the way he was coached. And I mean, frankly, you know, this is the first time I've ever seen him uh, on camera or, or off, uh, but he doesn't strike me as the type of person who's going to change his testimony based on what anybody tells him to say. Uh, Brian, there was also a long line of questioning about when and where John Floyd lived. 
What did you make of that line? They seem to be trying to raise doubts about his ability to know whether or not Fonnie Willis was dating Nathan Wade and when that relationship started. Did you find that effective? Brian? I get to Chris's point. Perhaps in front of a jury, I don't think in front of a, a judge, especially a practicing judge who's uh, done this before. I think what they're trying to do is create an argument come uh, summation or when they were making their arguments in front of the judge that either his credibility as to knowing when his daughter was dating uh, Nathan Wade or as to the fact that they kind of honed in on this, this was secretive that he knew about Deuces the DJ uh, because that must have been a normal relationship. That must have been something that was okay uh, for him and everyone else to know. But Nathan Wade's relationship with Bonnie Lee Willis was secretive, that even the father didn't know. But I think the prosecution did a very good job of rehabilitating that issue and saying, the only reason why you knew about the DJ is because you live there. Your daughter doesn't make a habit of telling you all the people uh, that she dates. And I think that rings true with a lot of people who are adults uh, dating people and have adult parents. They know who you're dating because of close proximity, not because you're out telling them all the time. Uh, Brian Willis's father also testified about death threats that she received as well as an incident when she was sworn in where her house was spray painted with a racist message. He says the home became uninhabitable due to potential threats. How does that play in to this question now of Willis's alleged misconduct? I think again this is where we got help. I think it's more background information and, and, and to give background information also the viewers, don't forget that Fonnie Willis is not just prosecuting Donald Trump and these uh, what used to be 18 defendants being forced to complete. She's also prosecuting Young Thug and YSL in the RICO case that involves gang activity. So there's a lot of quote unquote heat on that house from both of those cases. And I think it gives color commentary to understand why she had to leave, why she felt this amount of threat. And then his explanation for why he stayed there bolsters and credits Fonnie Willis's uh, testimony that she already gave earlier as to why she left and why her father still stayed. Uh, Chris, one of the questions at the center of this hearing is when the relationship between Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wayne started and whether it started before or after he was appointed as special prosecutor. We heard John Floyd there say he doesn't remember. He may have bantered with Wade and a few others at her swearing in, but he doesn't remember meeting Wade or even hearing his name until 2023, which was after he was appointed. How significant is that? So it's it's significant on a couple grounds, and I think the timing matters for two reasons. One, if she were involved in some sort of conspiracy to appoint him in order to financially enrich him and then enrich herself, this is something that this is a relationship that would have to have started prior to his appointment as the special as, uh, special prosecutor. But the other piece here is it lends additional credibility to both Bonnie Willis and Nathan Wade's testimony that the relationship didn't start until after his appointment as a special prosecutor. And so the father testified that he didn't really know a whole lot about the relationship, but at the same time, it lends further credibility to the idea that the relationship didn't start until after he was the prosecutor, or at least it ends a little more, and I know this is splitting hairs, but it, it, at least it ends further credibility to the idea that he didn't know anyway about a relationship starting prior to the appointment. Uh, Olivia, the court is now in recess. So what are the next steps and what's at stake here for the case against former President Trump? Well, it seems that they're still, I know we've discussed this a lot, but they're back to Terrence Bradley and trying to figure out what to do with him because he is a key witness for the defense. He is allegedly going to dispute claims from Willis and Wade about when the relationship began, about whether they lived together or not, which again could potentially open them up to perjury issues because of the affidavit submitted by Nathan Wade saying that they did not start dating until after he was hired on the case. So again, they're trying to get around that issue. He is still not there, the last that I heard. And the judge actually took issue saying, you know, could he be in contempt of court by failing to comply with a subpoena that has been issued for him? So again, when you ask about what's at stake, remember Donald Trump, the goal with all of this is to get Fonnie Willis kicked off of the case. And so they do seem to need Terrence Bradley in order to continue getting that across. Think of him as in line with a witness like Robin Yurdy, someone who is going to counter Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis on what they are testifying, someone who is going to allegedly put forward more details in line with what the defense is saying. So it really seems like that's a focus of what they're trying to get onto the witness stand today.
All right, Brian Buckmeyer, Chris Tibbins, Olivia Rubin, thank you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.